uh, when uh, Bob was uh, nice enough to join us for the first Capital Market Summit just a year ago, uh, he was already providing extraordinary leadership for our capital markets and technology and, and uh, clearly in, uh, NASDAQ was coming off the heels of its investment in the London Stock Exchange at the time and I asked him to predict uh, the future and he was smart enough not to actually try to answer my question, uh, but I think even if he had, nobody could have predicted the significant changes uh, within his own company uh, or, or within our markets uh, within the past year. Uh, the one thing you probably could have predicted is that uh, when it comes to leading the future for innovation and technology and uh, uh, driving uh, more transparency and uh, opportunity in global capital markets that Bob Greifeld was at the center of it and last year was, uh, was no exception. Uh, the acquisition of uh, and the uh, partnership with OMX, uh, the acquisitions of the Philadelphia Stock Exchange and the Boston Stock Exchange, uh, together uh, NASDAQ OMX Group is now a global uh, public uh, company services company, exchange technology and, and trading platform across six continents, uh, 3,900 uh, companies, number one uh, worldwide listings among major markets, uh, and uh, the tra trajectory in the last year is just uh, one year slice of what has been a remarkable uh, transition uh, for NASDAQ under his leadership uh, over the past uh, decade, and we are very uh, privileged to have him back as our keynote speaker, Bob Greifel. Thank you, David. I certainly do appreciate that very kind and generous introduction. Um, I, I would say we are quite proud of our accomplishments over the last year, uh, but the only question I seem to get is, as the CEO of the NASDAQ OMX Stock Exchange, what can you do to make the markets go up? Now, unfortunately, I do not have that power, but I can assure you that if I did, every day would be a good day. But when we think about what NASDAQ OMX is about, our critical mandate is to provide the most efficient and liquid market possible, and this efficiency and this liquidity has to perform in times of stress. Now when you look at our market, you have to first realize that our market is fully transparent. Investors in our market do not have to go to a theoretical pricing mark, uh, model to mark to market. Our transparent market provides all the same mark at the same time. We provide firm bids and offers in last sale for people to judge their risk. In addition, in our marketplace, the clearance and settlement function is centralized. We have central counterparty services with the DTCC, and that essentially provides centralized risk management. So the positive news that I can give you, if we look back in the last six or nine months, we can see that through all this turmoil that's happened, that one, our systems, being defined as our technical systems, and the system of the equity market uh, place itself, really have not missed a beat. They have performed incredibly well. Now, we have built our systems up to handle 250,000 transactions per second with sub-millisecond access time to incoming orders with 99.99 percent uptime. And I'd have to say, on certain days during the last nine months, we needed every ounce of that capability. But that certainly is very good news in terms of how the systems being broadly defined have performed during this period of time of great turmoil. Now, as the uh, CEO of NASDAQ OMX, one of the great opportunities I have is the ability to dialogue with our 4,000 listed company CEOs. And I really enjoy the talks I have with these folks, and it's also very informative to get the input from the, what I call the real economy. Now, it's interesting, I think, to a person, these CEOs are running their businesses in a very cautionary manner. In a certain respect, they're running it as if we are in a recession. My concern from that would be that it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy as people try to trim their expenses. It obviously ripples through the economy. But the positive news is the CEOs feel very strongly 
that their fundamental business drivers are still in very good shape. So they proceed with caution, but they see their core operating fundamentals are there. Now we have a similar phenomenon in the IPO marketplace. We see that we are in fact disappointed with the number of IPOs that have come public so far in 2008. There's been about 16 IPOs come public on the NASDAQ market. But what's interesting to note is the backlog of IPOs, those companies that believe their business fundamentals are strong enough to come public, is actually running ahead of what we witnessed in 2007. At this time in 2007, we had 91 companies on the backlog. This time in 2008, we have 98. So we see that, in fact, the core fundamentals are strong, and it would be our optimistic hope that we'll be able to come out of this period of time and launch into a very strong second half of 2008 and enjoy a high yield from the backlog that we do have. Now, as we think about the turmoil and the crisis that we've witnessed, and we see what's beset our economy, I think it's very easy to take a reflexive reaction, and that is to call for an increase in regulation. Uh, I think that's, again, something that we'll read about very much so in the press, we'll hear about in the media, but we would certainly say that before we come to any conclusions, we clearly have to advocate some analysis before any answers are trying to be provided. Now, as NASDAQ OMX, we directly own and operate eight exchanges. We also provide fundamental technology and expertise to 60 exchanges around the planet. So we are really in a unique position to have a comprehensive viewpoint of the different regulatory structures that exist around the planet. And I will say this, that I can say with great confidence that the approach of the SEC is fundamentally unique as compared to the other regulatory structures. Now that's a neutral word, unique, right? Neither positive nor negative, but it is truly unique. Now I think it's important to recognize that we as NASDAQ in the SEC firmament are recognized as an SRO, and that is a self-regulatory organization. Uh, but I would say to this audience that in the SRO structure that exists today, there is little or no exercise of judgment of our SRO responsibilities that we are permitted. And let me give an example. So just last week, we announced that we were launching a pan-European trading uh, platform. We see great opportunities to bring the efficiencies that exist in the U.S. market to the European theater. We see the opportunities to bring increased velocity, liquidity, and transparency to that market. Now, we filed for this trading status, which is known as an MTF, with the FSA. And what's interesting is as you're approved by the FSA, then you have, as an SRO, the ability to implement your rules, your functionality, your pricing, as you want and in the time frame you want, subject to conformance with some broad parameters that you've agreed to when you had your fundamental license approved. Now this is in stark contrast to what we see in the United States. In the United States, if you want to make any change in your rule set, you have to, even though you are an SRO, apply to the SEC, who will then put that out for notice and comment. And one of the most extreme examples of this was years ago, uh, we had the Pacific Exchange had to put a rule filing out for notice and comment to the public with respect to the dress code that exists on the floor of the, of the PCOS. And we have a person shaking the head, remember that. So a high point in the regulatory structure. Now, what happens as a result of this? What happens is we have then at the commission people who are lacking personal, practical knowledge of the markets deciding what is right for the markets. And so we see the staff of the commission spending time imagining the possible permutations of problems that might exist from the rule structure. So what does this mean in real life? Some real examples. When NASDAQ first developed the, uh, the Q index, which is our 100 most, uh, not actively traded, but highest market capitalization stocks, we recognized that this is a great product for the retail investors. 
So we also recognize that some of the retail investors would like to access the futures market for this product. So at the same time, we made an application to the SEC as the Chicago Mercantile Exchange made an application to the uh, CFTC. This application was essentially for the same product in different wrappers. One was uh, uh, a futures and one was an ETF. Our approval time took one year. The approval time in the CFTC took one month. Second example, on 12-19-2006, the NASDAQ stock market applied to allow the web to have real-time market data. So when you go to your uh, Yahoo or Google website today, you get data that's delayed for 15 to 20 minutes. This is in the public good to have real-time data available. We had Yahoo and Google very eager for us to get that approved. As we stand here today, uh, from the filing of 12-19-2006, it's not been approved. Another example, we filed for our options marketplace on January the 30th, 2007. We got approval on March the 12th, 2008. What's remarkable about that is we are the seventh options marketplace in the United States. And we were parroting the rules that were approved for the other exchanges. We were not blazing any trails with this, but it still took us uh, 14 months. So what happens, obviously, at the staff level, who has complete control over the process, who do not have practical knowledge of the marketplaces, who have taken all the power from the SRO, you land up with a dysfunctional organization when you consider the context of the competitive world that we exist in uh, today. Now, this information is not just recognized by ourselves on the outside, but I will read you a quote from Chairman Cox, and he says, for many years, Although the Exchange Act by, term, by its terms requires the SEC to publish SRO rule filings for comment, and if the rule is to be approved, to do so within 35 days. The division has routinely requested that the exchange agree to extend these deadlines while the rule was weighed and considered within the agency. The result was that it could take years before exchange rule filings were finally approved. Years. Now, uh, when we think about uh, this period of time as we will discuss, really, the regulatory structure in the U.S. capital market system, we certainly sense that we'll be entering a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to rethink some of the acts of 33 and 34. Our message is very straightforward. We first have to make sure that the current regulatory structure is in fact properly focused. Let us put the self back in self-regulation. Allow the people who live the market every day, who operate the market every day, to actually function as an SRO. We clearly uh, welcome and certainly encourage the oversight of Congress and the SEC as we're acting as an SRO. And I think, really, a secondary and probably as important benefit is to the extent the SROs can function as SROs, it creates the opportunity for the SEC to focus on certain fundamental uh, issues. Now, it was interesting to us as we went to complete the OMEX transaction and to start our pan-European exchange, we had to go to the different regulatory regimes, whether that be in Finland, Denmark, Iceland, Sweden, uh, or the UK. And in each and every situation, they wanted to spend the vast majority of the time assuring that we had the adequate capital to operate the markets. What's fascinating is here in the US, where we have such excessive regulation, where we'll speak directly to the dress code of the individual participants on the floor, there is no net capital rule for exchanges. The SEC has not focused on the fundamental underpinnings of the health, financial health of the exchanges. So we think as the SROs get power to actually do what they know how to do, the SEC can clearly focus on some more fundamental concerns and better fulfill their oversight responsibility. Now what was interesting to us is last week the Commission, under the capable leadership of Chairman Cox, announced a goal of mutual rec recognition of other regulatory regimes. I think this is a goal that has to be pursued. It is the proper goal uh, for the SEC. 
It's the proper goal in this globalized world. But we certainly recognize for us to get into that environment, we certainly need the SROs to function as SROs. And again, from our point of view, it's interesting, when we put our options market out for comment back in January of 2007, the world could see that. And in a world of mutual recognition, while we waited the 14, 15 months for that approval, the FSA or the CFTC could approve a similar rule set or any other regulatory regime that follows an empowered SRO structure, and the London Stock Exchange could put in that capability that we desired while we waited for 14 months. They could take our intellectual capital and have a year advantage as the FSA approved it, and then we recognized them as a fellow uh, or equivalent regulatory environment. So clearly mutual recognition is the proper goal, but we clearly have to make sure that we are positioned uh, to compete and to thrive in that environment. So, you know, in conclusion, I, I would say it's important to recognize that in the period of turmoil that we have lived through, the organized markets, NASDAQ being one of the leading examples, uh, that is transparent, that has market-driven pricing with central counterparty services has functioned incredibly well, incredibly efficiently and incredibly effectively during this period of time. In addition, I would say that the real economy is showing greater optimism uh, than what I'll call the virtual or certainly the financial economy, and we see direct evidence of that in the IPO backlog that we have today. We certainly recognize that we will go through soul searching with respect to regulation. We believe first and foremost, let's make sure the current regulatory regime is properly focused. We clearly want SROs to function as SROs. Let them le leverage their knowledge and their intimate day-to-day uh, -day dealings with the market. And we also think that the, uh, it's a multi-decade drive towards standardization of regulatory regimes across developed worlds, and we certainly encourage that, but we need to first ensure that our regulatory structure is efficient and is focused, and I do thank you for your time here today. Terrific comments and uh, a great addition to our program, and uh, you're at risk of being invited back for the third <laughs> annual summit. Uh, let me uh, open it up to questions. And uh, uh, while we get a mic to the first question, if you'd raise your hand, I will ask the first question, uh, which is to tell us a little bit more about the, uh, the pan-European platform, and in particular, uh, what you think that will lead to down the road. Do you envision a, a genuine global trading platform at some point, and how far away do you think we are? Well, one is, I would say, uh, to say something good about the U.S. capital market system, uh, because it is the most deep, liquid, and transparent market on the planet. Uh, when we look at the European marketplace, there really has been country-by-country country monopolies. And under what's known as the EU MIFID directive, those country-by-country country monopolies will, for the first time, face competition. So if we look at the cost of transacting in the European theater, it's anywhere from five to ten times what it costs in the U.S. And that's on the trading side, not on the clearance and settlement side. On pan-European clearance and settlement, the differential is actually a similar or greater magnitude. So it's a very simple uh, proposition that we're bringing to the European market. We're bringing our proven technology, as I said, that's capable of sub-millisecond response uh, while doing 250,000 transactions uh, per second. And we're going to bring our pricing schedule over to Europe, and we're not going to approach it in an incremental fashion. So we'll be part of that dynamic that the competitive uh, world will uh, release, and you know, we're obviously excited uh, about that. With respect to globalized trading, we're not such a big believer in, in that. Uh, you have time zones to uh, fight with that, uh, you know, something you can't really do anything about. And the data point I'll use is that here in the U.S., exchanges, NASDAQ included, have tried for the past decade to have investors trade outside the normal market hours. So we're open from 9.30 to 4 officially, but clearly our systems are open for trading, say, from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. But absent a major news event, all the volume is done between 9.30 uh, and 4 o'clock. 
So if we cannot get the U.S. investors to trade at 7 a.m., I think it's a little unrealistic for us to think the European investors are ready to come in and trade at 7 a.m. So sooner or later, the prediction of 24-hour trading will be right, but I think it's not the short term, not the medium term, but more of the long term. Yes, in the back there. We'll start with the one back there and then go right here to Jim Angel. If you'll get the mic over to the back. Diana Torres from the Partnership in New York City. Mr. Greifeld, um, you've been a thought leader on competitiveness issues on a, on a range of subjects, including regulation, of course. Can you share with us your thoughts about what is the greatest threat to U.S. competitiveness, and then what is the greatest opportunity for U.S. competitiveness? Okay. Uh, that's a great question. So uh, what is the greatest opportunity? We'll, we'll start uh, uh, with that. You know, I, I think it's certainly the attitude of the folks, uh, I think, in uh, certainly Wall Street, certainly at NASDAQ, that given a level playing field, uh, we're more than happy to uh, compete in, in a very effective uh, way. And we see that with Europe, right? It was impossible for uh, U.S. exchanges to come into Europe in a meaningful way unless they were trying to buy an existing monopoly. Now, with the MIFID rules changing, that creates a world of opportunity uh, for us. A market size, you know, roughly 80 percent of our U.S. market now is available to competition. So to the extent we have a fair uh, shot, uh, we, we kind of like uh, our abilities and, and our chances. I would say what I see on the threat side is the advantage of countries being smaller, I think, sometimes helps. When you spend time in London, it's clear and present that the economic success of that city and that country is determined by uh, financial services, and they are very concerned about the health of the financial services system in, in that city, and they look at it in that broad scope. Uh, here in the U.S., when you think about the exchange world and the mission of the SEC, sometimes it's more narrowly defined to the uh, protection of retail investors, and that obviously is a noble goal has to be there, but it also has to be somewhat more expansive a viewpoint. So the smaller the country, the more focused I see from the ministerial level on down to let's make sure we're successful in, in, in our endeavor. And I think sometimes in the U.S. our success is assumed uh, that it would be there, and there's a lot of friction then built into the system without a clear mission to be, uh, you know, driving towards the goal. Jim Angel from Georgetown. Jim Angel from Georgetown University. In a world where exchanges have become hyper-competitive technology companies and where FINRA does most of the self-regulation, um, does it make sense for exchanges in the U.S. to have any SRO duties at all? Um, would uh, the shareholders of NASDAQ OMX Inc. be better off just exiting from the SRO business and concentrating on the trading business? Right. That, that's a great question. I think first and foremost you have to recognize that uh, NASDAQ as the exchange has uh, the SRO license and we answer to the, the SEC. So FINRA is a vendor of regulatory services to us, but we are fundamentally uh, on the hook or responsible to the Commission for the proper discharge of that regulatory responsibility. So in that we have to have the right audit and right capability to, one, establish the, the rules and to make sure that FINRA uh, then are implementing the market rules that, that we uh, uh, develop. So there's no two ways about it. So, and we're clearly separating member regulation from market regulation. So we have the fundamental responsibility to the SEC for market regulation and we certainly should have that responsibility. You wanted to follow up? Uh, what, what I meant was in a reform regulatory scheme, should have in a reformed regulatory scheme, should exchanges have any market reg responsibilities, or would we be better off just letting the exchanges compete and letting someone else take care of market reg? Right. That, that's a great question, and that's one of the reasons why uh, you know, we uh, encouraged you know the FIN relationship. So from Nasdaq point of view, we first recognize to the Commission that we have the responsibility for the regulatory piece. We keep uh, major parts of that regulatory piece in-house, such as the listing decision, the delisting decision, the intraday market uh, uh, surveillance. But things that go past the day, we then outsource to, uh, uh, to FINRA. 
and we are very comfortable with the structure, we're very comfortable with the quality of regulation that FINRA provides to uh, our, our marketplace. But to the extent that FINRA was not providing that level of surveillance and control on the regulatory side, we certainly want the ability to respond to that because, you know, as our license to the SEC and our responsibility to our investors, we have to make sure that the market is properly regulated. So, no, we think we want the ultimate uh, say on the quality of the regulation for our market. Additional question? Good. Yes, go ahead. Clearance and settlement. As an SRO, what is NASDAQ doing to properly police its members and uh, protect issuers from excessive settlement failures? Uh, that uh, obviously has been a hot topic uh, uh, with our, our is issuers. And we, you know, it's centered around the question of uh, short selling and the failure to deliver uh, on a short sell. Uh, so we think one is the Commission is on the right path uh, to solving the vast majority of the problems. Uh, when you have to locate uh, before you sell short, we think that's a, a positive outcome. Uh, what you need eventually in the system is automation. So if you're going to sell short, you have to then secure that, uh, that inventory of the stock and make sure that's locked in. So I think we'll get there. I think the interim step the Commission is taking now where there's going to be some sort of regulatory regime or penalty associated with failing to deliver is, is again a step. So. I think we're getting there. Would you be in favor of a pre-borrow requirement? I, I, what I'm in favor of is a, uh, a system hopefully developed by private industry. Uh, and I, in a past life, was in this type of business, so I certainly recognize great opportunity. So any time you try to go to short, you have to have a system that's connected to all the sources of the liquidity of the uh, stock available to borrow and that stock available to borrow is then decremented based upon people making a contractual electronic commitment to it. So it's a locked in system. Just like in today, in the front end trading system, if you go to hit the bid in, uh, in Apple, you own Apple at that point in time. So it would be the same methodology with the end state for uh, people who want to short. Boy, technology has transformed exchanges and markets dramatically. Do you think we're, uh, where do you think we are in that evolutionary process? And uh, what uh, changes do you think technology can drive in the midterm that will uh, kind of supersede what, uh, what we need to expect from the regulatory structure? Well, I think what we just spoke about is actually one of the biggest technology holes in, in the marketplace today. You know, if you came into an electronic world today and recognized that people were shorting a, a stock without any tie to a physical inventory system, right? So if we think about it in general terms, the development of a physical inventory system for shares available uh, for, for borrow right, is not a technological challenge that is breaking any new ground. So to think we don't have that system in place and the users who want to uh, borrow to, uh, short or long can't tie to that. So that certainly is uh, something that's there. Uh, Three-day settlement. Uh, so we have certainly taken great pride in the fact that our system, broadly defined, and the settlement system has worked very well. Uh, but in 2008, it's hard to think that we still need three-day settlement. Would be another thing that uh, uh, comes to mind. You know, years ago, we talked about going to T plus one, but you know that hasn't happened. So those would be the two things that are on the top of my mind. How about the uh, developments such as the options exchanges and and you know electronic trading platforms for uh, alternative. Uh, Financial products. Where do you think uh, that you know, is, what, what will be the mix uh, going forward in terms of those products? Well, the, the options market certainly of all the derivatives market is the most automated. So it's really uh, you know going down the the volume scale. So if we look at the organized markets today, whether that be the formation of Nasdaq or uh, the the longer term exchanges, they typically have been developed you know with regulatory. Uh, direction. So as we look at the world that we see and the problem of trading these over-the-counter instruments, there's clearly X number of these over-the-counter instruments that could trade well enough in a transparent marketplace that has central counterparty services. 
So I think that will be one of the fallouts or discussion points we'll have in the, in the years to come. Where can you bring a exchange type functionality where you have transparent marking to market and central counterparty services to other asset classes? Right? That doesn't work for every asset class and it's certainly a function of the volume uh, and the interest in the exchange. If you're doing you know, two trades a week in a particular type of instrument, then clearly you know, automation doesn't bring much to the table. But there's plenty of that situation where the benefits of central counterparty and transparent price discovery would be a major benefit to the system. Bob, thank you very much. And I think uh, uh, we'd all be loath to try to predict uh, the year ahead. But uh, my, my one prediction still stands true that I, uh, as uh, we look to uh, reform our regulatory structure to uh, ensure we have competitive capital markets as we drive uh, changes in global exchanges, you will be at the center of it and uh, we will right. rely on your advice. And thank you. Our lacking personal, practical knowledge of the markets deciding what is right for the markets. And so we see the staff of the Commission spending time imagining the possible permutations of problems that might exist from the rule structure. So what does this mean in real life? Some real examples. When NASDAQ first developed the uh, the Q index, which is our 100 most, uh, not actively traded, but highest market capitalization stocks, we recognize that this is a great product for the retail investors. So we also recognize that some of the retail investors would like to access the futures market for this product. So at the same time, we made an application to the SEC as a Chicago Mercantile Exchange made an application to the uh, CFTC. This application was essentially for the same product in different wrappers. One was uh, a futures and one was an ETF. Our approval time took one year. The approval time in the CFTC took one month. Second example, on 12-19-2006, the NASDAQ stock market applied to allow the web to have real-time market data. So when you go to your uh, Yahoo or Google website today, you get data that's delayed for 15 to 20 minutes. This is in the public good to have real-time data available. We had Yahoo and Google very eager for us to get that approval and have a year advantage as the FSA approved it and then we recognized them as a fellow uh, or equivalent regulatory environment. So clearly mutual recognition is the proper goal, but we clearly have to make sure that we are positioned uh, to compete and to thrive in that environment. So, you know, in conclusion, I, I would say it's important to recognize that in the period of turmoil that we have lived through, the organized markets, NASDAQ being one of the leading examples uh, that is transparent, that has market-driven pricing with central counterparty services, has functioned incredibly well, incredibly efficiently and incredibly effectively during this period of time. In addition, I would say, that the real economy is showing greater optimism uh, than what I'll call the virtual or certainly the financial economy. And we see direct evidence of that in the IPO backlog that we have today. We certainly recognize that we will go through soul searching with respect to regulation. We believe first and foremost, let's make sure the current regulatory regime is properly focused. We clearly want SROs to function as SROs, let them le leverage their knowledge and their intimate day-to-day uh, -day dealings with the market. And we also think that the, uh, it's a multi-decade drive towards state. I would say uh, to say something good about the U.S. capital market system, uh, because it is the most deep, liquid, and transparent market on the planet. Uh, when we look at the European marketplace, there really has been country-by-country -country monopolies and under what's known as the EU MIFID directive, those country-by-country -country monopolies will for the first time face competition. So if we look at the cost of transacting in the European theater, it's anywhere from five to ten times what it costs in the U.S. And that's on the trading side, not on the clearance and settlement side. On pan-European clearance and settlement, the differential is actually a similar or greater magnitude. So it's a very simple uh, proposition that we're bringing to the European market. We're bringing our proven technology, as I said, that's capable of sub-millisecond response uh, while doing 250,000 transactions 
uh, per second. And we're going to bring our pricing schedule over to Europe, and we're not going to approach it in an incremental fashion. So we'll be part of that dynamic that the competitive uh, world will uh, release, and you know, we're obviously excited uh, about that. With respect to globalized trading, we're not such a big believer in that. Uh, you have time zones to uh, fight with that, uh, you know, something you can't really do anything about. And the data point I'll use is that here in the U.S., exchanges, NASDAQ included, have tried for the past decade to have investors trade under of regulatory services to us. But we are fundamentally uh, on the hook or responsible to the Commission for the proper discharge of that regulatory responsibility. So in that, we have to have the right audit and right capability to, one, establish the, the rules and to make sure that FINRA uh, then are implementing the market rules that, that we uh, uh, develop. So there's no two ways about it. So, and we're clearly separating member regulation from market regulation. So we have the fundamental responsibility to the SEC for market regulation, and we certainly should have that responsibility. You wanted to follow up? Uh, what, what I meant was in a reformed regulatory scheme, should exchanges have... In a reformed regulatory scheme, should exchanges have any market reg responsibilities, or would we be better off just letting the exchanges compete and letting someone else take care of market reg. Right. That, that's a great question. And that's one of the reasons why uh, you know, we uh, encouraged, you know, the FIN relationship. So from NASDAQ point of view, we first recognize to the Commission that we have the responsibility for the regulatory piece. We keep uh, major parts of that regulatory piece in-house, such as the listing decision, the delisting decision, the intraday market uh, uh, surveillance. But things that go past the day, we then outsource to, uh, uh, to FINRA. And we are very comfortable with the structure. We're very comfortable with the quality of regulation in about 14 months. So what happens, obviously, at the staff level, who has complete control over the process, who do not have practical knowledge of the marketplaces, who have taken all the power from the SRO, you land up with a dysfunctional organization when you consider the context of the competitive world that we exist in uh, today. Now, this information is not just recognized by ourselves on the outside, but I will read you a quote from Chairman Cox, and he says, for many years, Although the Exchange Act by, term, by its terms requires the SEC to publish SRO rule filings for comment, and if the rule is to be approved, to do so within 35 days. The division has routinely requested that the exchange agree to extend these deadlines while the rule was weighed and considered within the agency. The result was that it could take years before exchange rule filings were finally approved. Years. Now, uh, when we think about uh, this period of time as we will discuss, really, the regulatory structure in the U.S. capital market system, we certainly sense that we'll be uh, entering a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to rethink some of the acts of 33 and 34. Our message is very straightforward. We first have to make sure that the current regulatory structure is the uh, CEO of NASDAQ OMX. One of the great opportunities I have is the ability to dialogue with our 4,000 listed company CEOs. And I really enjoy the talks I have with these folks. And it's also very informative to get the input from the, what I call the real economy. Now, it's interesting, I think, to a person, the CEOs are running their businesses in a very cautionary manner. In a certain respect, they're running it as if we are in a recession. My concern from that would be that it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy as people try to trim their expenses. It obviously ripples through the economy. But the positive news is the CEOs feel very strongly that their fundamental business drivers are still in very good shape. So they proceed with caution, but they see their core operating fundamentals are there. Now, we have a similar phenomenon in the IPO marketplace. We see that we are, in fact, disappointed with the number of IPOs that have come public so far in 2008. There's been about 16 IPOs come public on the NASDAQ market. But what's interesting to note is the backlog 
of IPOs, those companies that believe their business fundamentals are strong enough to come public is actually running ahead of what we witnessed in 2007. At this to be somewhat more expansive a viewpoint. So the smaller the country, the more focused I see from the ministerial level on down to let's make sure we're successful in, in, in our endeavor. And I think sometimes in the U.S. our success is assumed uh, that it would be there and there's a lot of friction then built into the system without a clear mission to be uh, you know, driving towards the goal. Jim Angel from Georgetown. Jim Angel from Georgetown University. In a world where exchanges have become hyper-competitive technology companies and where FINRA does most of the self-regulation, um, does it make sense for exchanges in the U.S. to have any SRO duties at all? Um, would uh, the shareholders of NASDAQ OMX Inc. be better off just exiting from the SRO business and concentrating on the trading business? Right. That, that's a great question. I think first and foremost you have to recognize that uh, NASDAQ as the exchange has uh, the SRO license and we answer to the, the SEC. So FINRA is a vendor of regulatory services to us, but we are fundamentally uh, on the hook or responsible to the Commission for the proper discharge of that regulatory responsibility. So in that we have to have the right audit and right capability to want establish the, the rules and to make sure that FINRA are then are implementing the market. Uh, which is to tell us a little bit more about the, uh, the pan-European platform and in particular uh, what you think that will lead to down the road. Do you envision a, a genuine global trading platform at some point and how far away do you think we are? Well, one is I would say uh, to say something good about the U.S. capital market system. Uh, because it is the most deep, liquid, and transparent market on the planet. Uh, when we look at the European marketplace, there really has been country-by-country country monopolies. And under what's known as the EU MIFID directive, those country-by-country country monopolies will, for the first time, face competition. So if we look at the cost of transacting in the European theater, it's anywhere from five to ten times what it costs in the U.S. And that's on the trading side, not on the clearance and settlement side. On pan-European clearance and settlement, the differential is actually a similar or greater magnitude. So it's a very simple uh, proposition that we're bringing to the European market. We're bringing our proven technology, as I said, that's capable of sub-millisecond response uh, while doing 250,000 transactions. Uh, per second and we're going to bring our pricing schedule over to Europe and we're not going to approach it in an incremental fashion. So we'll be part of that dynamic that the competitive uh, world will uh, release and you know, we're obviously excited uh, about that. With respect to globalized trading, we're not such a big believer in, in that a mutual rec recognition of other regulatory regimes. I think this is a goal that has to be pursued it is the proper goal uh, for the SEC. It's the proper goal in this globalized world. But we certainly recognize for us to get into that environment, we certainly need the SROs to function as SROs. And again, from our point of view, it's interesting. When we put our options market out for comment back in January of 2007, the world could see that. And in a world of mutual recognition, while we waited the 14, 15 months for that approval, the FSA or the CFTC could approve a similar rule set or any other regulatory regime that follows an empowered SRO structure. And the London Stock Exchange could put in that capability that we desired while we waited for 14 months. They could take our intellectual capital and have a year advantage as the FSA approved it. And then we recognized them as a fellow uh, or equivalent regulatory environment. So clearly mutual recognition is the proper goal, but we clearly have to make sure that we are positioned uh, to compete and to thrive in that environment. So, you know, in conclusion, I, I would say it's important to recognize that in the period of turmoil that we have lived through, the organized markets, NASDAQ being one of the leading examples, 